Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's true. There are so many times that the only way we really realize our need of you is to go through hard times. And Lord God, my desire from my own heart this morning, my desire for each one of us is that we would leave here with an absolute and overwhelming sense of our need of you. That that would go down to the core of who we are. And that that sense of our need of you would be strong enough to move us out of a place of comfort and ease and lukewarmness. And it would lead us to really call upon you and seek you and allow you to be fully God in our lives. So God, send your spirit and revive us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Newton's first law of motion, and clever, listen carefully, you might need to correct me here. <laughs> Makes you nervous when you have a physics professor in the audience. Newton's first law of motion is that an object at rest will stay at rest unless it's acted upon by an outside force. And an object in motion will continue in motion at that same, in that same uh, direction at that same speed unless it's acted upon by an outside force. You might think of inertia as simply an object's uh, change or resistance to change. So the greater an object's inertia, which corresponds to its mass, the greater the resistance to change of that object. Now, this comes in handy for us all the time, right? The fact that things have inertia. I mean, just imagine how hard it would be to find your keys if they didn't have inertia. If just up on their own, they'd start floating around and moving all sorts of funny places if they, that object at rest didn't stay at rest. I'm going to have a hard enough time finding them as it is. And if they started moving places, I mean, can you imagine? So perhaps we're going to do a little classic demonstration of inertia here this morning. And this really will be an experiment. Uh, we'll see if this works. Where's Don Hoffman? Now, earlier, when I set this up on the stage, Don told me, if I could do it twice, you remember Don, right? <laughs> he said he'd give me $100. Now, later, he kind of backed it down a little bit. He said maybe a 20. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see. Now, okay. So an object at rest tends to stay at rest. This battery is at rest and there's no outside forces coming upon it. That's one. <laughs> now, why does it fall straight down? Gravity fall makes it fall straight down. There's no other forces that are acting upon it when I pull out the plastic ring. There's no other forces that act upon it and shift it in any other direction. So d gravity is the only force, and its inertia is keeping it straight so it falls straight down. Don, are you getting nervous? You've got that 20. All right. Oh, Don, make sure to shake my hand as you leave today. <laughs> so, just a few days ago, last week, I guess, I was thinking about my own spiritual life. 
And I was thinking about how my own spiritual life has inertia. That it tends to stay in place. In fact, it tends to remain motionless and at ease unless there's some external force that acts upon it. And maybe you've experienced this in your own life. As I've thought about it more and more in these last few days, I've come to think that spiritual inertia is one of the greatest fights that we face as Christians. That because of our sinful nature, there's this tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. That our spiritual inertia is resistant to the change that God wants to bring about in our lives. And by the way, God's in the business of change, right? Not Himself. He doesn't change. He doesn't need to change. But He's all about changing us from the inside out, but we have this spiritual inertia, this spiritual sluggishness that keeps us in the same place day after day, week after week, month after month, and dare I say it, even year after year. And there's this spiritual inertia in our lives. And it's a fight for there to be movement and life. Now the greater the inertia of an object, the harder it is to move it, the more force you need to overcome the inertia of that object and to set it in motion. And this morning, really the heart of what I want to, to talk about, and I must be honest that I'm preaching to myself, is our need of revival. Now, I'm not talking about uh, revival in the sense of a series of meetings and a program that is planned. Uh, but when I say revival, I'm talking about when the Spirit of God and, and a sense of spiritual urgency and zeal, that those forces in our lives are greater than the forces that hold us back and hold us in place, and that there is life and that there is motion in our spiritual lives caused by the Spirit of God. Because sometimes, far too often, you and I are stuck. We are spiritually stuck. Planted, and we're not going, we're not changing as God desires us to. So this morning, just very quickly, I want to just as a backdrop to looking at this concept of spiritual inertia, I want to just very quickly walk you through the steps of revival as outlined in uh, the Bible. Um, now this isn't a list that you can find anywhere in one verse, but if you read the books of Judges and Kings and Chronicles, Isaiah and many other places, there's a pattern of re decline and revival in the Scriptures. Over and over again, God's people, they reach a place where they are spiritually at rest and at ease and lukewarm and comfortable and there has to be a revival something that causes change and the first step to that revival is always urgency now I I don't believe that any of us would say today I have zero desire to change spiritually I, I believe each one of us would say, yes, I want to grow, I want to change, I want God to, to, to work in my heart. But here's the question. How much do you want it? How urgent is that desire? Because the truth is, often we say, I want to change, but we are content enough for that change to be some distant time in the future, and that desire is not great enough for that change to take place here and now. There's no spiritual urgency. 
Jesus said, in the days uh, before His return, it would be like in the days of Noah. There's no spiritual urgency. He said people will be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. All good things. But if the world is about to be ended in a flood, how important is dinner? How important are other engagements and activities? Where is the spiritual urgency? So in Scripture, there's always something that brings about urgency for revival to take place. As this urgency is... Uh, grows in the hearts of God's people, there comes upon them a conviction uh, 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 of sin and a desire to repent or to turn from that sin. Then they begin seeking God with all of their hearts. And this is one of the reasons that urgency is such a crucial step of revival because nowhere in Scripture does it promise us that we will find God if we seek Him with half of our hearts. Nowhere in Scripture does it promise us that we will find God if we seek Him with 90% of our hearts. From Genesis to Revelation, over and over and over again, the statement is repeated, you will find Him if you seek Him with all of your hearts. And without urgency, without that spiritual fire, we are comfortable enough to seek Him with just portions of our hearts and our minds and our souls. And that little bit of seeking is like a spiritual inoculation that prevents us from getting the full dose of God in our lives. That seeking is manifested in the revivals of Scripture as prayer and fasting and seeking God with all of our hearts. Time and time again, uh, people who are experiencing revival personally or, or, or as a congregation, they come together, they call an assembly, they pray, and they seek God. And finally, that revival is sealed with a covenant, a commitment, a proclamation that God, here I stand. I will seek you. We will seek you. Because you are worth it. You are worthy. And this morning, we don't have time to go through each of these five parts to revival. We're going to just key in on that first part, that aspect of urgency. Maybe some other time we'll take these one by one. How does urgency come about in our lives? How is it that, desire, that the desire for change becomes not just a desire that's put off, that, uh, that's in, in the future, but is a desire for the here and now? And that that force is greater than the forces that hold us back. And movement takes place. We'll go to our scripture here. Revelation 3, verses 14 to 19. Revelation 3, verses 14 to 19. Turn with me there. When you get there, you can say amen. This is a letter to one of the seven churches, the last of the seven churches. Do you know who it's a letter to? Laodiceans. To the angel, verse 14, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. <coughs> that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now get the picture here. Do these people feel any urgency to change? 
No, they're comfortable, they're lukewarm, they feel rich and at ease. Life is pretty okay. It's fine. Spiritually, they're not terrible. They're not cold. They can look at all those cold people and be thankful they're not like them. But they are also not on fire. Their spiritual inertia has them firmly planted in place. Verse 18. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed, not the, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now notice who it is that they can't see. They can't see Jesus. But they also can't see themselves, can they? They don't even realize their own state because they feel okay. And by the way, that's one of the most dangerous feelings you can have as a follower of God is the simple feeling that everything's okay. It's not bad. Maybe it's not great. But it's okay. Jesus says, As many as I love, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, notice what the punchline is. Be zealous and repent. He said, right now you're in this state of apathy, this state of lukewarmness. What you need is to be zealous. You need some spiritual urgency, some spiritual fire in your life. He says, the way this is going to happen, and oh, by the way, before I tell you the way it's going to happen, let me remind you that I love you. Now, why does he need to remind us that he loves us? Because we don't like the way, at least one of the ways, that God tends to bring about urgency in our life. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Now, rebuke, pretty familiar with that. Words of correction, right? He just gave the Laodiceans some right there. But then there's that second word. It's not just talk. As many as I love, I rebuke and I what? Chasten. What does it mean to chasten? means to discipline. Not just with your words, but with your actions. So to this morning, what we're going to look at is how God uses chastening to bring about urgency in our lives. How God uses chastency to bring about this desire this force of change in our life. We will see that God loves us so much that He can't leave us comfortable and at ease. God has two ways to bring about urgency and zeal and revival and change. He's got a plan A and a plan B. We're going to actually start with the plan B. Plan B is desperation. To bring us to the point where we realize through and through our need of God. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, we're looking at verses 5 through 6. When you get there, you can say amen. Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6. He says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. So this is the language of parenting. God is our Father. 
We are His sons. We are His daughters. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens, and He scourges every son whom He receives. Now, we know this is true in our own lives. As children and as parents, we know that parents who really love their children, they have to discipline them, don't they? They have to chasten them. And that chastening is not pleasant. In fact, verse 11 says, Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It's like, none of us like the chastening of God. It doesn't feel good. But it's absolutely necessary to our spiritual lives. I want to pause here for just a moment. I want to give a disclaimer of what I'm not saying and what Scripture is not saying this morning. These verses are not saying that every bad thing you go through in your life is a punishment from God. They are not saying that every time you experience pain or suffering or your plans don't work out or there's heartbreak or whatever it is, that God is punishing you because of something you've done, because of the way you've misbehaved. That was the interpretation of Job's friends, wasn't it? Job, you are going through all of this because you've messed up, and now God is getting His vengeance, and He is uh, exacting what is due. So Job, you must have really been bad to go through all this. No, we live in a world where there's a battle going on, we have an enemy who does not love us. There's consequences of sin all around us. And much of the pain and suffering we experience is just uh, collateral damage from living in a sinful world. But the scripture is also very clear that because God loves us so much, there are times when we are at ease and co at comfort. We have no realization of our true spiritual state. There is no urgency. And God will use less than pleasant means to wake us up, to move us off center, to bring us to a point of desperation and cause us to seek Him. He's not doing this out of meanness but out of profound love. Because you see, to God, our character is far more important than our comfort. You and I value comfort almost above everything else. And that's why it feels so good to be in that lukewarm state, right? It's all cozy, you're just floating there, everything's nice. But God says, no way, that's too dangerous. Your character is far more important than your comfort. And so, he allows us to be chastened. Isaiah 26, 16. Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. Now, notice, when was it that they called upon God? When was it that they prayed and cried out to him? When everything was warm and cozy? No. It was in the hard times that they realized their need of God. When God's chastening was upon them. We see this theme over and over and over in Scripture. Uh, go with me to Deuteronomy 8. Here in Deuteronomy 8, we can see a bit of the, the dilemma of God who wants to bless His people. Who, who, who wants to give them uh, uh, abundantly good things. Who wants them to enjoy the, the blessings of this world that He has created. But realizes that there's a danger 
when life is just a little bit too good. Deuteronomy 8, we're looking here at verses uh, 5 all the way down through 16. Uh, just a little background here. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, um, is Moses' kind of last address to the people of Israel before he goes and, and, and uh, is laid to rest up on the mountain. The Israelites have been in the desert for 40 years. They've been going through terrible hardship and trial, and now they are just on the verge of the promised land, the land of milk and honey, the land of ease and comfort. And God and Moses are both concerned about the spiritual well-being of the people. Verse 5. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son... So the Lord God chastens you. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in His ways and to fear Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water and fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Now just pause. For 40 years you've been in the desert. You've eaten manna. Everything is dry and parched. The water comes from the springs that God provides. It is a land of hardship and desolation and waste. And now you're about to go into this land flowing with milk and honey where there's an abundance. God knows there's spiritual danger there. Verse 10. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which He has given you. Verse 11, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His judgments, and His statutes which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, in which were fiery serp serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rocks, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you and do you good in the end. What is God's dilemma? The fiery serpents and the dry land and, and, and the, the uh, people who were so unhappy to see the Israelites, all of those things, God used them for good, for His end vision for the Israelites. And that end vision was not a place of physical comfort, but of spiritual growth, where they could rely upon Him and experience intimacy with Him. And God wants to bless them physically, but He knows the danger. So He warns them. Not just here, but all throughout Deuteronomy, uh, the prophets, over and over and over, the people are warned. If you uh, become at ease, if you become comfortable, if you forget God, He's going to allow things to happen to wake you up. They're going to carry you away from this land. They're going to take you captives. The Babylonians and Assyrians are going to come. And when they do, remember that if you seek God with all of your heart, if you pray to Him, if you cry out to Him, He will answer and He will hear you. So God brings His people to a place of desperation. Now, there are times in our lives when you and I have been there, right? When the, very, the, the natural thing to do was to go into your closet and get on your knees and cry out to God and let the tears run down your face and you called upon Him and called upon Him until He answered. 
And it was hard, and it was miserable, but God was there, and you were seeking Him, and you experienced Him as a living reality in your life. But then there are other times where the daily grind of the day and the distractions of the world, the screens and all the other things around us distract us and make us feel at ease and at comfort and we can barely even remember to pray. We can barely even remember to seek Him. He's just in the back of our minds somewhere amongst all the other things and we're experiencing spiritual inertia. God wants us to experience urgency. One of the ways he does that is bringing us to a place of desperation. But as I said, that's his plan B. That's actually not his first choice. That's not his preferred way of doing things. God's preferred choice the way that He would like you to experience revival and spiritual urgency and the way He would like you to, 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 to be led to the place where you seek Him with all your hearts is not by desperation, but by inspiration. Now, I will admit, when you read the pages of Scripture, you will find far more examples of God using desperation than you will of Him using inspiration. And that is simply because the human resistance to change, the human spiritual inertia is so great that often that still small voice is not enough and God has to resort to plan B. The second reason is that the stories just often aren't as dramatic. But this is God's primary way. The way He longs to move. Not from the outside in, but from the inside out. And I want to just look with you at one story. Somebody who didn't have to be brought to the point of desperation, but experienced revival in an entirely different way. 2 Kings, chapter 22, Verse 19, Josiah became king as a boy, and almost from the very beginning, he began seeking God as best as he knew how. Now, at that time, because of the wickedness of Ahab and so many of the other kings, a knowledge of God had grown faint. The, the temple was in disrepair. Even access to the scriptures of God was hard to come by. So one of the things that Josiah did was he began some renovation projects there in the temple. And as they began renovating the temple, they found the book of the law, the book of Moses. The priest brings it into Josiah and begins to read the words of Scripture. And Josiah hears these words and he hears passages like we just read in Deuteronomy 8, where God says, When you come into the land and you've got money and you've got food and you're at peace, don't forget the Lord God who is your deliverer. He said, Because if you forget, the armies are going to come. They're going to carry you and your people off. Josiah hears these words. And there's an urgency that is born in his heart, not because of exterior circumstances, but because of the Word of God burning like fire inside of him. And he hears these words. And he cries out, he calls for the prophet. He said, we've forsaken God, we've turned to idols, we've turned our back upon Him. Are these things going to happen to us? Hold it, the prophetess comes in. It 
2 Kings 22, 19. This is what she says. Because your heart, this is a message to him from God, from the prophetess. Because your heart was tender. In the Hebrew it means soft. Responsive. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard that I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants. And they would... And they would become a desolation and a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Now just pause here. What the prophetess is telling Josiah is because your heart listened to God, God has listened to you. He said, all those others... The armies came. The famines came. But their heart was not listening. And so they were distant from God. Because your heart was tender, God has heard you. Jump with me over to chapter 23. Josiah continues to respond. It says, Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, all his soul, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. Not desperation, but inspiration. They hear and they respond. This morning I want to finish with one last story. One that's familiar to us. Elijah, because of the idolatry of the Israelites, had prophesied a period of drought and famine for three and a half years. For three and a half years, the rain didn't fall, the crops didn't grow, and that urgency increased. Gradually, in the hearts of some of the Israelites who were listening, there began to be a sense of desperation. It comes to a climax when uh, Ahab and, and Elijah are both there on Mount Carmel, Ahab and his priests call out to Baal. They cut themselves. They ask Baal to send the rain. Nothing happens. And Elijah kneels down, prays a simple prayer, one or two sentences. The fire falls. The altar, the sacrifice are consumed. The people are astonished. And shortly thereafter, it begins to rain. But Jezebel's not done with Elijah. And Elijah, even though he's seen the astonishing power of God, he's afraid. He begins to run. He goes to Horeb, Mount Sinai, where God has been known to reveal himself in powerful ways. He goes there, he's in a cave. God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah goes out. There's an earthquake that shakes the mountain. There's wind that rips things apart. There's thunder and lightning. And Scripture is very clear. In all of those things, God was not present. But then, there's a still, small voice. A whisper. 
And God was in that whisper. That is where his presence was. Elijah had seen the people moved by the external workings of God. When he was afraid, that's what he felt he needed. He went to the mountain. He wanted those visible, outward, external signs. But God, in essence, was saying, Elijah... Our relationship is not like that. I shouldn't have to move you from the outside. I shouldn't have to dazzle you uh, with a big show. Our relationship is intimate and personal. I will speak to you in a still, small voice. That's how you will hear me. I don't think it's an accident that you and I live in a world where hearing the still, small voice of God seems almost impossible. I think there's a very well-designed plan to keep the noise and the distraction and the busyness going all around us so that we cannot listen and hear when God is trying to speak to us through inspiration. And my fear for myself, my fear for us, is that if we don't learn to listen to that voice now, if we don't allow the Scripture in a quiet time, in a quiet place to speak to us now, that God is going to have to resort to external means to create urgency and desire and zeal. There are storms gathering in our world. There's no doubt about it. We are in a time like none other. And I believe God's heart is longing not to chasten his children, but to speak with them, to dwell with them, to be intimate with them. And if God is going to move us to a place of revival, if there's going to be change in our life that takes place through inspiration, we have to be listening. Because He is speaking. And He doesn't want to turn up the volume and use the external means. He wants to speak to us from the heart. So in your minds, would you just take a minute and think about what it is in your life that makes it hard to listen to the voice of God? What is it in your life that is distracting and noisy and preoccupying and that makes you feel spiritually comfortable? I know in my own life, it seems every time that I look at a screen, almost, my sense of spiritual urgency gets smaller. Now, there, there are many times that you can do amazing things on computers. My brother Bemnet here studies with people all over the world, shares the truth of God. But there are so many other distractions that I would venture to say that in your life as well, often when you're looking at that screen, your heart isn't burning with a zeal and a passion for God. In fact, it becomes all too easy to forget about Him. What is it in your life 
that you need to turn down so the voice of God will become louder and more distinct in your heart. Heavenly God, Father, we thank you that you are a God who is a father, who loves us like children, and who loves us too much just to leave us the way we are. Oh God, save us from ourselves, save us from our spiritual sluggishness. We pray that uh, from the inside out, that the, the love of Jesus Christ would motivate us, would change us, would inspire us, would set our hearts on fire. And that, Lord God, we would experience urgency and revival. Lord, help us to encourage one another uh, to this end. And above all, may we listen as your Spirit speaks. In Jesus' name, amen.